let's start with what I can't do for you today. I am not a trained expert. My field is not in special needs. So anything that I share with you today is similar to what you're doing with your children. It is based on my own efforts to do research and to spend time around trained experts that have helped me gain some of the understandings that I have today. So nothing that I share with you today should be taken as clinical diagnosis or expert referral. This is all parent to parent sharing. I am a parent just like you. The only difference between what I might bring to the table today and someone else is that my kids are adults and the ones that have had challenges, I've gotten to see how it turns out after they're 18. I know for me, those kinds of stories were really valuable when I was dealing with the issues that my kids have. So today is about sharing, all right? Not diagnosing, not medical information. This is about sharing experiences. One of the wonderful things about being a part of my company, Brave Writer, is that I've gotten to work with literally tens of thousands of families. We have something like almost 400,000 unique visitors to Brave Rider every year. We've taught somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000 families in our online classes. I've worked with every kind of kid that you can imagine. Our staff, our teachers, have worked with all kinds of kids. Every day we get someone asking us, what should we do about dysgraphia? Can my child take your class if he's ADD? Do you address dyslexia? And I want to give you this confidence right now. It's a resounding yes. One of the amazing aspects of Brave Writer, and it was sort of a stumble upon, not something I set out to do, but the practices that we use work incredibly well with children who have learning differences. These are not kids who are necessarily broken. These are not kids who are somehow defective. What we're dealing with here is a wide range of functionalities in our human disposition. And we are diagnosing them now because we have the capacity through brain research, through specialization in the field of medicine to identify these detailed nuances person to person. But don't you think all this existed in the Middle Ages? By Jove, yes. <laughs> Nothing about this is new. What's new is our amazing understanding about the brain, about the plasticity of the brain, about the way our neurology works. And so when we look at a child and we say, hmm, something doesn't match, what we're doing is we're actually comparing that child to traditional education standards. Here's one of the things that I learned early on with my son, Noah. My son, Noah, my oldest child, you know how hard it is when your oldest child is the one who has a learning challenge, right? My oldest child was not suited for traditional education. Does that mean he wasn't learning? Today, when I look at Noah, my 28-year-old child, I would say that he is extraordinarily gifted talented, intelligent. He has capacities I don't have. He also had limits I don't have, but those limits, unfortunately, are the ones that are most conducive to being productive in traditional educational environments. And what that means is traditional schooling is evaluating their student population, not just by whether or not they learn in this manner or this manner, they're matching them to what they would consider a standard. And then your child is like down here trying to catch up. But what happens if your child is at home with you? What happens if the child that you have is able to attend to their academic growth according to the functionalities of their brains and their neurology? How awesome would that be? What an extraordinary extraordinary gift we might give our kids if we could accommodate their uniqueness as opposed to pathologizing it and treating it like it's something to be afraid of. I have to be honest, I was afraid a little bit. Early on, I knew Noah was not like the garden variety child 
whatever that is. Um, oh, let me just read this comment real quick. That was our daughter last year in public school. Homeschool has made a world of difference. Oh, thank you, Allie, for sharing that. Absolutely. So let me tell you my little story about Noah before we really get going. When Noah was a baby, an infant, uh, he went everywhere with me. I wore him on my body. We breastfed. He was one of those little, you know, packages uh, that I took everywhere. I lived in Morocco at the time, and the roads were very uneven, so we didn't even have a stroller. I don't think I had a stroller until he was almost two years old. Everything we did was a backpack or a front pack, and uh, I didn't have any other kids, so he got all my attention. When he was about, I don't know, two years old, we moved back to the States, and um, we lived in this community apartment complex. Actually, I guess he was a year old. So it would be during that, between a year and two years that first year. And Noah had this disposition. If we were standing side by side and I said, hey, I'm going over here, Noah literally went the opposite direction. We lived in a nice gated area community, you know, apartment buildings where everyone's family could converge in the little courtyard. And we left our doors open all the time because the whole community was there together. We all knew each other. This wasn't a standard apartment. This was a place for people who were on furlough from being um, from living abroad. So it was a very safe community. So we would leave our doors open so our kids could go in and out. But no, it was only one and two, so I couldn't leave him alone. But I would leave the door cracked, and he would go outside. And literally, I knew I had 30 seconds to catch up with him before he was in the middle of the street. He never wanted to go on the play equipment. He wanted to barrel through the front gate and go straight for the middle of the street. Who's got a kid like that? Anyone? Literally, they never go the same direction as you. Anyone have kids like that? How many have kids who, when you went to the, you know, clothing store or Target, you lost them in the clothing rounders, right? So you're walking along and all of a sudden you're in this terror because they're missing and you have to start parting the clothes? Okay, that was Noah. Ha ha, look how many of you have kids like that. Absolutely. And don't you feel like you're doing something wrong when your, you know, best friend says to her son, Joel, can you just stand here for a moment? And he just walks over and stands next to her like, yes, mom. Okay, mom. <laughs> have you ever had that experience? I remember asking this mom, Chris, whose son was named Joel, and Joel and Noah were exactly the same age. And I, I had lots of judgments. You know, when I was young, I had judgments of every parent. I'm sure you do too, because you don't know what you're doing. So you find yourself evaluating them against yourself, and you're trying to figure out, well, who's doing it right? Which, by the way, doesn't exist. We're all just muddling along. <laughs> so I remember having some judgments of the different parents in this apartment complex, and it suddenly dawned on me, oh my gosh, they all have judgments of me. I need to find out what they are. So I went to my friend, Chris, who I, who I really trusted. I said, Chris, it occurred to me that um, everybody has judgments, and I want to know, honestly, what I'm not doing well in my parenting of Noah. And she, like a really good friend, said, I will do that for you, but I'm going to take three days to think about it so that I can tell you what I think in a kind way and know that it's important for you to hear. And I thought, wow, that is so nice of her. So she came back to me three days later and she said, the one issue, you're so nurturing with your kids, with Noah, I was pregnant at the time, you're so nurturing, I was like out to here, chasing Noah up and down stairs, I'd find him climbing through the second story, you know, wrought iron, holding on on the outside, and I'd have to save his life, right? This is my life, my life was saving Noah's life. And so the friend said to me, I've noticed that you use your body to stop Noah from disobeying you. And what you need to train him to do is to listen only to your voice. And I thought, oh, that is insightful, but how do you get this kid to listen to your voice? So she suggested timeouts. And I thought, all right, we'll try that. So I remember the very first time Noah, you know, quote, disobeyed me. What was he, two? Running the other direction? I had to chase him down. It wasn't like I could say, hey, go to time out. He didn't like my voice. He liked running away. <laughs> so I ran after him. I scooped him up. My belly's out to here. I've got this toddler on my body who's like wriggling to get away. And we go into the house and I said, now, Noah, 
you have to learn to stop when I call you. You can't run into the street. You can't climb on the outside of these stairwells. And I put him in the bathroom and I closed the door. I said, I'm going to set the timer for, a, you know, 30 seconds, like your first time out. And I closed the door and a moment later, the door opened and he walked out. I said, no, 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 Noah, you have to stay in there. This is a time out. I put him back in. I walked away. He followed me out. And I suddenly thought, this is impossible. Hello, Kazakhstan. I, this is impossible. Noah doesn't listen to me. <laughs> How is he going to stay in a timeout if he doesn't listen to me? The kid is active. He uses his body for everything. What's really wonderful is I am still friend friends with Chris. And her son, Joel, is a full adult. Both our kids are 28. And I said to her not long ago in the last six months, I said, do you remember the advice you gave me about making sure Noah listens to my voice and to not use my body? I said, it never worked <laughs> his entire life. And she started laughing and she said, oh, what did I know? I had two kids. I got one like Noah after that. And I just cracked up. And so I just wanted to open with that share. Your kids are who they are from birth. There's no magic formula here that's going to solve the problem of supervising a child who's got a personality and a disposition that is so not conducive to just that gentle control of a parent. In fact, all learning differences, all learning styles deserve a unique parent. If you have five kids, you'll have five approaches. Each child deserves a parent who sees who that child is. I think I've already mentioned that I'm not a huge fan of what I would call obedience. <laughs> this idea that the authority of the parent is more important than the nurturing of the child. So I want to throw that out up front too, because if you're all about finding tools for getting that to happen, you might want to click out of this scope. That's not my temperament, and it's also not what I've discovered to be the most successful with kids, especially with kids who are not the cookie cutters of the school system, okay? So let's go ahead now and really embark on this discussion um, one of the things that I wanted to share, first of all, is that I admire parents. Yesterday, I told some of you that I was going to go to the zoo for the afternoon, and I got to. It was just wonderful. I hadn't been there without kids in my entire life. And I was there with the man in my life, someone I've been dating for four years, and we're just walking around, and we're seeing moms and little kids everywhere. And the very first place we went was to the elephant stand. And this actually relates to this discussion, so don't think I'm just wasting time. Um, and we're watching these elephants, and there's three of them. And right next to us is a mom with a little kid in a stroller and a toddler running around. And she grabs, and the toddler was more like a preschooler, maybe four years old. And she grabs his hand and she says, come here, honey, let's count the elephants. And just like that, the boy points one, two, three with his finger and he says, four, five, six. There are six. <laughs> and his mother just cracked up. She said, sweetie, I think you started at the wrong number. And he goes, she said, there, there are three. Can we try counting again? And he says, two, three, four. There are four. And so she takes his hand in hers and she says, one, two, three. And then he repeats it. And then they both crack up. And it suddenly struck me. An adult frame of reference was quantity. We were talking about a quantity of elephants. And what this child was feeding back was a sequence that he had mastered. He had learned numbers differently as a preschooler than the parental intended objective. But was this little dude wrong? Not even in the least. He did a beautiful job of coming up with the sequence. He remembered it. It sounded musical. He had learned it. So as we're thinking about these learning differences, I challenge you to see if you can see what's being fed back to you. What has the child learned? What is that child expressing to you that doesn't necessarily match your objective, but certainly reveals learning? That would be my first principle. 
Think about what is being revealed to you, how that child is conveying learning. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, one other funny experience at the zoo. These were cracking us up. I mean, literally. There was one little running kid and the mother said, you may not run. And I thought, why would you tell a three-year-old not to run? This is the option. You know, let him run. He'll wear himself out and take a great nap on the way home. Um, we will do an older example of this, I promise. Um, in fact, I'll definitely do that. And I've got to pay attention to the time here. Um, so anyway, uh, another example was a child who the mom said, are you going to be a good boy today? If you're a good boy, I'll get you an ice cream cone. And he yelled, no. And I thought, how awesome that this child's self-definition did not depend on ice cream. It depended on saying no. I loved that. So I want all of us to remember that what we're fighting for here is the self-definition of our children. Um, when I was working with Noah in his early years, I did have some questions about him. Uh, it took him a while to learn to read. I think he was just about eight or eight and a half when it really clicked. I couldn't get him to really pay attention the way I thought he was supposed to. He was an incredibly kinesthetic child, though, so creative. And uh, one of the things, thank you, Leslie, one of the things that I discovered with Noah is that very short-term incentives worked well, and I wondered about that, but long-term ones didn't work at all. So I met with an educational consultant, and she told me, she had worked with Noah a little bit, and she told me, you know, he might be ADD, but I uh, am not certain of that, and I'm not sure I want you to test him. And I thought, oh, okay, I won't test him. She said, what I would do is I would get tools about ADD. I'd apply the strategies, but I'd never apply the label while he's at home. And that was a shock to me because I thought, well, if I had a diagnosis, then I would know what to do. But her impression of Noah was that he just needed a more specialized environment. So the book that I bought at the time was this one, ADD Helping Your Child, Untying the Knot of Attention Deficit Disorder. And honestly, this book is pretty old. I think you can buy it. Um, you can go ahead and take pictures of your screen if you want. Uh, I, it doesn't deal with technology or anything. I mean, it was printed in 1994. But here's what I found. The strategies were helpful, but some of the chapters were so oriented towards traditional school that I suddenly realized the opportunity that homeschooling was. So we did our best to accommodate Noah. And I'm here to tell you we never did have him tested. He did not go through any kind of examination until he was in, um, in college. Yes, Rebecca says sometimes we need labels to get helpful services, and I'm going to say that with Liam because I did need it for Liam. Um, and actually, I asked Noah recently if he felt like it would have benefited him to know about this earlier. There's a complexity here, right? We all are dealing with individual children. And one of the things that we discovered with Noah is there was a fragile self-esteem issue going on there, something not going to go into deeply here. But there was, there was some, you know, he was my oldest. You're the hardest on your oldest. And it seemed to me that accommodating his learning style was protecting his self-definition. And interestingly, today, as a 28-year-old, he just paid for a battery of psychological tests, $1,200 of his own money. And for the first time, he is treating his own ADD. And it has been phenomenal. And he is so proud of what he knows about himself. The whole profile dealt with intelligence, focus, attention, everything. And I'm just going to throw this hint out to you. But Noah and my next child, Johanna, who's 26, We'll be here tomorrow, and we're going to do an impromptu scope slash podcast conversation, the three of us. So maybe he'll share some of that. Yeah, so I asked him, do you regret not testing sooner? And he does not. He needed to explore who he was and his education for himself all the way into his 20s. He's tried college three times. He's on his third try. He needed to do that. And what I needed to make peace with, with Noah, was that he was in charge. 
We used to joke about it all the time, that age and maturity were going to be his best friends. Because as Noah has had more control, he's had more success. And one of the amazing things about him is he has never experienced himself as, you know, flawed in that way. Like, he's definitely felt some failure, and he'll probably share about that. But I think at a core level, Noah knew he was bright and knew that he had intelligence. It was just trying to figure out how it works with the system. So I'll let him speak for himself because he'll more than happily share. He's awesome. He's given me permission to share anything about him or our relationship. Yes, um, someone on here is saying she's a late bloomer. And as a matter of fact, uh, Stephanie Elms from the Homeschool Alliance, she always says that um, there are no educational emergencies. And I just want to underscore that. The other child I wanted to talk about today is Liam. Oh my gosh, I just remembered a third child of mine with an issue. <laughs> Let me bring that up really quickly. Jacob, who is, you know, quote, the star homeschool child. He's on a full ride scholarship at Columbia Law, right? He wants to work in human rights. He spent his year in Thailand working for the Human Rights Commission on the loose scholarship. The guy is like a superstar, right? He started out life with a speech impediment. And we took him to the local public school where he went to speech therapy every week for a year. So we made use of those services and it was wonderful for him. And once he caught on and was able to talk and able to read, you know, he never looked back. But we had that to deal with as well. He developed a whole sign language before he could speak. He didn't say full sentences till he was three years old. And this is the kid who's excelling as a speaking person, believe me. Okay. <laughs> and then the last one that I really wanted to mention was Liam. So these are all three of my boys. My girls don't have these learning circumstances, although Katrin did not read until she was almost 10. So you should know that. But we don't think she had any issues that were diagnosable. I think she was just a late reader. With Liam, however, he was a dysgraphic. And he found it quite challenging to wield a pencil. Some of you know my story. We did not do writing with him from ages 9 through 11, uh, but he was incredible at compensating. Some of you might notice this with your kids. So for dysgraphics, dyslexics, even attention deficit kids, they might be masters at memorization. How many of you have kids who are just amazing at memorization uh, compared to your kids who are like, you know, the traditional learner, the one who's used to reading and handwriting, and that's all very comfortable. What we've noticed and what I've learned from other uh, experts, yes, very good. Very, very good. Oh, I love seeing all of you say yes and, and telling me about your children. Memorization is this incredible skill that they use for compensation. And one of the things about that that I find so fascinating is that they are able to access a part of their brain that people like me who depend on reading just ignore, just like leave by the wayside. So that's an example when we're talking about older kids or even young kids, how are they expressing their learning in a way that we can validate? Yes, exactly. Vision impaired kids memorize beautifully. I have um, a cousin who is legally blind and he's the same way. Oh, yes. In fact, a nine-year-old who's not reading will be an amazing memorizer. And that was true with my kids. So memorization is one thing. Another thing is they also really benefit from creating verbal connection. Now, not all of them do. If you have a child with a language processing disorder, verbal and written can both be a challenge. In those instances, what you want to foster is intimate dynamic. You want to have an opportunity for that child to feel emotionally safe to take speaking and writing risks with you. I absolutely recommend being a transcriptionist, a hired hand, a secretary for your kids who have a difficult time with writing or even with speaking. I've shared before and I'm going to share it right now again. Catch your children in the act of thinking. Catch your children in the act of thinking. It will come at the most inconvenient time. It will be when you don't have time to jot it down. But I'm telling you right now, jot it down. Get out that sheet of paper and jot down what they say. And those 
words, even if they're stilted, even if they seem insufficient, once you get them down, you share them with a meaningful re uh, relative in their life. How long do you transcribe for them? Until they leave your home. <laughs> do you want to know something amazing? Even when I was in high school and I was writing my college application essay, I was stumped. I had written this very dry, very dusty essay, and my mother, who's a professional writer, jotted down my essay for me. She sat me down. She told me to close my eyes. I was a junior in high school, so just remember this. Maybe I was a senior. Honestly, it was my senior year. She said, close your eyes and describe to me the vision of your life when college is over, and I'm going to write it down. And she typed it because I was blocked. I couldn't move the hand and access that vision at the same time. I was paralyzed by terror. So you can, you know, scribe perfect. That's what Meep's mom says. She scribes for her 11-year-old. Absolutely. And here's the thing. Anytime your kid moves up a level in writing, so they go from being comfortable to now having to apply themselves to an unknown format, their corresponding confidence is going to decrease. One way to help them up a level is to upgrade your support until they're comfortable again, and then they get going again. Is that a question, Karen, that scribing is different from writing? I would call them the same. I like to say that if you chop off both their hands, God forbid, and gouged out both their eyes, God forbid, they could still be writers because the person doing the scribing is merely decoding language and putting it on the page. We want our kids to be able to write for themselves, to transcribe for themselves, because that's a shortcut and they will need it in college and beyond. So we work on those, but we do it independently. We help them get those tools until they're working together like a bicycle flying down the road. You do mechanics, original writing, mechanics, original writing, and you do this simultaneously but independently until they get comfortable. During the original writing phase, when they're not comfortable, handwriting for them is a great aid. How old, so how old are they when you stop? So I would rather not create an artificial bar with a time that you stop. Rather, what I would suggest to you is incrementally give them that confidence, move from being the full transcriptionist to being a partner in writing. And this is something that we've talked about before on these scopes and in Brave Writer. Partnership writing simply means that you are providing the adequate support for the current level of challenge. And you can slowly back off as that child gains skill. Someone's asking, what do you do when they don't want you? Oh, you stop when they don't want you anymore, exactly. So you can do things like this. You can start writing down what the child is saying and then hand the pen and paper over and say, you seem like you've got a good thing going. Can you keep it going now? Another thing you can do is you write a sentence, they write a sentence, you write a sentence. Oh my goodness, I forgot. Oh shoot, I was going to bring my, um, uh, I bought them for this specific talk, and it's in the other room. Um, I have post-it notes that have lines on them like this. And instead of handing your child this huge, big sheet of paper to write on, you can limit the task to a note card size that has lines on it that's got the stick -em on the back, a post-it note, and have them just write one idea. And then tomorrow, they can do another idea on another sticky post-it note with lines. And then another day they can do one more idea. Maybe it's just a sentence or a fragment or a cluster of words. Start sticking them on the window in your room, like in your school room. Just stick them on the window. And by the end of the week, your child is going to see this buildup of all this writing they've done. And then you can take the sticky notes down and type it into the computer. And suddenly there's a whole paragraph and it's all your child's writing. Does that make sense? So this is one of the ways that we help our kids. Sure, it can be all about the same topic, um, asks Mama Webb. But what if it was five different topics and you actually had five different sentences, sentence starters for development over the next month? 
And you could say, remember when you wrote this one? Yes, even smaller notes. That's right. Someone said even smallers. It, it, it can be big notes, little notes, whatever helps that child write. I know when Liam was dyslexic, we did all kinds of things. Um, he was pretty good at typing because I gave him free reign on the computer and he taught himself like all kids do today. Um, but he also loved keeping a birding book. We were huge birders. So he couldn't write paragraphs, but he could write down the name of any bird that we saw, whether it was at the zoo, whether it was on a birding outing. Uh, Allie is asking, did you use color slips over worksheets? I never use those. I'm not sure what those are, but that sounds really fascinating. Um, I, I think what you're saying is where you can write maybe with um, dry erase and wipe it off because we did a lot of that. We did a lot of dry erase. When he was young, we did tracing the finger inside pans of rice and sand and gel. There are lots of ways to use the hand. I'm not really going to give you a big lesson on dysgraphia, but what I wanted to say is that my kids, oh, I see, reduces the glare so they can see better. That's what those do. Thank you, Allie. Colored films for reading challenges. See, I knew you guys were going to be experts at this. That's fabulous. Um, I appreciate you posting those comments because they're benefiting everyone. And in fact, one of the things I wanted to do, and we're sort of running out of time, but I created a resource guide for learning differences, and I posted this on the Periscope page. And you, you can sc screenshot this, and if you click on the link for the free download, you can go get this. It's totally free. You enter your email address, and then it'll be delivered to you. And it's just a list. Go ahead and screenshot that, or just remember, Periscope after BraveWriter.com. BraveWriter.com slash Periscope. Um, I created this little list of resources that's been meaningful to me and to some of our people. But it doesn't mean that you don't have better ones because some of you are like, ah, amazing experts on all of this stuff. But what I wanted to share with you is what to do when you have a child with these learning differences who isn't amenable yet to therapy or doesn't want to go in and get treatment. Because, I don't know, I was just one of those moms who didn't like pushing my kids into emotional pain. For better or for worse, <laughs> that's what I did. Thank you for putting that in, Jeanette. So what we did is when Liam was young, I offered an enormous amount of support. And then I did what I call the six-month check-in. Every six months, starting at nine years old, when he started showing really deep signs of dysgraphia, he was also a lefty, left hand. Um, we would go on a walk, and I would talk to him about his learning challenges. I would say, you know, I know you're struggling with copy work and you really don't like writing. And we have a friend who could actually help with that. Would you like to see her for some handwriting help? And he would say, no, not interested. And I'd be like, all right. And we'd finish our walk. We always had to walk side by side. I couldn't talk about this eye to eye because it felt uncomfortable. So we did well walking side by side. I'd say to him, okay, well, I just want to remind you that writing is going to matter in your future, but I don't want to force you into something that's difficult. So every six months or so, I'm going to check in with you, and we'll do a little bit of writing here and there, but I am not going to push you to write beyond what's comfortable. And then in six months, I'll check back and we'll see how you feel. Well, we did this for three years, nine, 10, and 11, every six months, every six months. During that time, I created some of our best writing program activities because Liam couldn't write. In fact, to be honest, most of the projects in partnership writing came from working with Liam. Uh, absolutely, to get original writing out of Liam, I created projects and I did the transcribing. Someone's asking about penmanship. That's right, we did not do it. He knew how to write his letters and he knew how to use a pencil, but he hated doing it. Even math was becoming hard. He was developing this math brain like you cannot believe. I think online gaming is what created the math person that Liam is, and chess. I mean, he's just incredible at math, but he didn't do a lot of writing. And so one of the things that we ended up doing is one day, oh, let me just restate this. 
So one day, Liam came home from having to fill out a form at his lacrosse team, and he could not fill it out. And he walked through the door, and I'll never forget it because it was such an alarming moment for me. I was in the kitchen, you know, doing what you do. And he walks in, he goes, Mom, I'm ready to meet with Rita, our therapist. I said, oh, what, what changed your mind? He said, I was trying to fill out this form, and the lines were too narrow for my kind of handwriting. And I realized I need it. I said, awesome, I'll make the call. And so the person that I called, I'm lucky, okay? <laughs> the person I called was Rita Sabasco. You can find her at ritaspeak.com. She's brilliant. Uh, she's local. She homeschooled her kids. And uh, he was almost 12, 11 and a half, Allie, is when this happened. Almost 12. RitaSpeak.com. Her name is Rita Savasco. She is the designer of the wand. She is a speech and language pathologist in Ohio. And Rita is a friend of mine. Her kids and my kids were very close. She discovered Brave Writer because of me and her children and loved it. And here's what she told me about Brave Writer, which was gratifying to me because I am not a speech and language pathologist. She said to me, I love what you're doing in Brave Writer because the Speech Path community deals with reading almost exclusively, and they still teach writing in the traditional school model, and it's ineffective. What you're doing for writing is what we do for reading and speech. I want to bring these together. And I was like, do it. So when she goes to her conventions, she like brings my stuff. She takes the writer's jungle, she takes her products, and she shares them and talks about how to approach writing differently. But then, of course, I wanted to get in on her expertise, so we brought her in and asked her to help us create a product that would marry the reading and the writing together following her approach. And, of course, she is, for those of you who know this stuff, looking for my cards here, she's, like, been influenced by Orton Gillingham. So those of you who know this for dyslexia are well aware. So that's an influence on the wand, and you'll see it when you're in there. She's also a huge, huge fan of Pete Bowers from WordWorks. And all of these are going to be on that resource guide, so don't worry about finding them. Rita has taught for us, and her classes are always hands down the most popular. But she had two daughters get married and one son go off to college this year, <laughs> so she couldn't work for us. Um, but hopefully she'll be back. In the meantime, uh, benefit from her through the wand. Um, Topic title, this seems really interesting. Oh, um, yes, we're talking about ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, dysgraphia, learning challenges for parents who either are homeschooling or after schooling or dealing with their children. Um, yes, she, Rebecca, she also spoke at our Brave Writer Retreat. That's right, she was fabulous. Um, we are lucky to have her. I'm hoping she'll come back this next summer. In fact, the Brave Writer Retreat for this summer is July 13th to the 15th in Cincinnati, Ohio. And we are going to deal with all kinds of practical ways to put the Brave Writer lifestyle and home education principles of the Homeschool Alliance into practice. So I hope you'll come to that. Okay, let's see. Wow, these go so long, I just get talking and talking. All right, what else did I want to tell you before I wind up here? Oh, yes. So I did a little, yes, the retreat is going to be amazing. Oh my gosh, we are so excited about it. It's at this gorgeous, this location that's got gorgeous grounds and we have run of the whole place. There's a labyrinth, there's a place to have a huge bonfire. We're going to have music, you know, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be a retreat and we will absolutely give you details. We're building the page right now and the prices. There will be, you know, Periscope uh, discount because you are all such fabulous fans. So don't worry, more detail coming soon. But what I wanted to share before we wind up here, because we've already been going for 45 minutes, is this. Um, I asked one of my friends about an autism camp that her son went to because autism, as Rebecca Bison shared with us in one of her periscopes that she called, oh, where is my little enchanted scopes? Oh, that she called an enchanted scope. Hashtag enchanted scope. Um, 
She talked about her kids and equestrian experiences. Her autistic son gets to be a part of horseback riding in a context that's really wonderful for his temperament and his style of learning. Well, I have a girlfriend whose son is autistic. She actually is a young mother and her son is, you know, 10 or 11. And he goes to a place called, uh, did I write it down? I don't think I wrote this one down, but it's on the resource guide. It is called surfershealing.org. Surfershealing.org. It is a surfing camp for autistic kids. And she said it was phenomenal. They were in this huge community of kids who were all similar, parents who all had a shared experience, and the instructors were just so sensitive and fabulous. She said it was the most like a, a utopian mountaintop experience for her boy. And they live in Ohio. They aren't near an ocean where surfing is a part of the culture. This is an opportunity. Um, yes, there's one in Florida, fabulous, the Heal Foundation. If any of you know of other organizations like that, please put them in the comments. But I thought this was fabulous. Here's the thing. Oh yeah, and actually I'll just add this. Liam loved animals. In fact, so much so that one year we bought a zoo pass and we went to the zoo every single week of the school year. He was a little bit awkward socially when he was young. That's completely gone now. But he was, he was uncomfortable with human beings. So animals were the bridge and he loved animals. And I even capitulated to rats <laughs> and ferrets. <laughs> so Liam could have the cuddles that he needed from animals that he could love. So when you're dealing with kids who have learning differences, animals are great. Camps designed for them are great. Physical activity, both Noah and Liam loved lacrosse. It was this very physical, very, you know, manipulative, use your hands and your bodies kind of sport. Um, put them in environments that show them themselves, that show them their strengths. That's what we want for our kids, for all of our kids. And we don't want to measure them by the academic traditional school. That's the opportunity we have in a homeschool environment. Oh yes, music, absolutely music. Even online gaming, I know everyone has a perspective about that, so I'm not gonna overstate my point of view about technology, but I have watched both Noah and Liam navigate relationships online that have actually become not only real life friendships, but sources of true soul to soul connection. It's been incredible. And I've also watched them work through frustration because of online gaming. They have to, it's important to. They are being self-starters. They are navigating a whole world and relationships and figuring out how they can, uh, you know, master a problem, stick with it long enough to get through it. These are good skills for kids like that. And you know, Noah today is interested in computer programming. I'm convinced because of all that experience. Oh gosh, I'm not gonna name games. Your kids will know better than me and it's better for them to tell you. Um, oh, last thing, poetry is awesome for dysgraphic, dyslexic, auditory processing. And here's the reason. It's short, easy to remember, and it has rules. And for some reason, these kids who are like more mathematical and less linguistic, love the structure, love the rules. We have a playing with poetry workshop that is a family class in Brave Rider. It's coming up in November and it's one tuition as many kids as you have. So you pay one price and then if you've got two kids, it's that price. But if you have six kids, it's that price. And the whole family is doing poetry for a month. We've seen so much success with kids who struggle with language in that class. Fabulous class. So sign up if you're interested in expanding the writing experience for some of your language impaired, language challenged, language differently children. Okay? Yeah, poetry is so great. Text to speech apps are fabulous as well. Um, I noticed that my kids wanted to improve in spelling because they didn't want to look stupid in gaming chat rooms and gaming discussion. So that's another benefit to having them interact online with their peer group. 
I notice people are jumping off because I've been going on for so, 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 so long. So let me just wind up here. Um, so this is the, uh, you know, advertising portion of the show. The resource guide looks like this. And it is located on bravewriter.com periscope slash periscope. Okay. Uh, best speech to text app. A lot of people use Dragon. I know that. I haven't used it. Yeah, watch the replay if you signed in late. Um, go here to get the resource guide. All right. And then um, if you are interested in uh, more of my teaching and you want to understand Brave Writer from the inside out and you want to get a feel for what our perspective is about education and nurturing your children and combining all of these for a rich family and education life, my DVDs are here! Yay! Nurturing Brave Rider Families. This is from the retreat in 2014. It's all my core teachings. There are five DVDs for six hours of teaching. And if you go now, you can use the October OOPS15 code to get $15 off. The October introductory price is $99 for five DVDs and you can take $15 off and bring it down, okay? We also sell these as digital downloads for less expensive, so you can do it that way. Oh, look at that. Someone's already listening to the MP4. Wonderful. So I hope you'll buy them. I was begged to do this for years. It's a huge investment on my part to pull this off. We used a professional team. I don't say that to make anyone feel bad. I just want you to know it's like high quality, and I made a big investment, and I hope that you all enjoy them. And it's a great thing to get ready for the next retreat because I'm not redoing these, okay? Next retreat, no cameras, just us playing with all the concepts and having a great time. Um, anything else? If you do a Periscope about the Enchanted Education, use this hashtag so I can find you because I want to. Oh, Suzanne Barrett, there she is. Suzanne is one of our master teachers. She's been with me the longest. I've known her for, what is it, Suzanne? 15, 20 years? She's out of this world, gets the best feedback every time. She herself has an MA in British literature, Shakespeare, and poetry. The woman rocks fan fiction. She is like, I mean, the resource of the century. Take classes with Suzanne, period. Just want to say that. 20 years. Oh my gosh, is that, that's just incredible. <laughs> I love, love, love Suzanne. She's amazing. Yeah, you better get in there. Cindy, who runs our registration, says it's almost full. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. Oh, my goodness. You guys are awesome. Yeah, we have two classes starting on Monday, by the way. Yeah, Rita Sabasco. RitaSpeak.com is Orton Gillingham Lady. Okay, we have two classes starting on Monday. Literary Analysis for Teens of the Good Earth and Write for Fun, which is for your middlers. And both of those still have space. So if you'd like to sign up, go to BraveWriter.com, click on the online classes, and you'll find them. Okay, everybody, thank you. This was a fabulous, fabulous scope. I didn't even cover everything I thought I would. I thought I was going to run out of things to say. Apparently, that never happens. So thanks for being here. Thank you for all the hearts. Um, feel free to share with your friends. And I really enjoy this. Monday, Enchanted Education for Teens. Live honestly, write bravely, and stay tuned this weekend for a sneak scope with my older kids. We're going to get that in, okay? Love you. Hey, maybe we will do a part two. We'll see. Send me your questions. Bye, everyone.